So, Berto, I have a bunch of emails to answer. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and I'm also a professor. My name is Umberto Castagna, and I attach rubber soles to shoes. Patron Stewart from Scotland says, Hi, Kirk and Umberto. In your episode, Psychology of Vegans, in 2018, you referred to the concept of population growth control, but remarked that that's for another episode. It would be a great topic to discuss, environmentalism versus social Darwinism, etc. Berto, what do you think about environmentalism, social Darwinism, and population growth control? Yeah, super charged topics for sure. Uh, I've always found it a little interesting, very interesting that, you know, universally in the West, uh, the Chinese population control was decried. Uh, and some of it, I think, <laughs> rightfully so, because... If the stories are accurate, um, it was done in, it sounds like in a brutal way and also very sexist way and, and so forth. Yeah. For, forced uh, abortions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now, the flip side is, I think, you know, we, we have this notion, again, mostly in the West, of ultimate freedom. Like, we are free. We should be free to do whatever we want. If I want to have 50 kids, I should be able to. Um. And there have been times in history where that sort of wouldn't have bro broke. Yeah, we can't the even bank. get Americans to wear masks. You know? <laughs> right? Can you imagine getting right. them to <laughs> not have as many children as yeah. they as they want to? And honestly, you know, two hundred years ago, uh, someone has twenty kids. That's probably good. Like you, you need a lot of people. People died, you know. So like uh, nowadays, if everyone uh, adult right now was having twenty kids. I think in two generations, or even we're, four, we're done. You know, or even, even four. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then the question is like, well, should we mandate that they don't, or should we just like educate that they don't? And that is a great question. I, well, I, and but and the answer is, um, if you raise people's economic status, then people have fewer children. Right, but and, and that's not sort that, of not accidental. That it's easier it wasn't, said than easier said than done. Yeah, but, and it wasn't. Yeah planned let's say and right. it just happens to be the like case. you know japan for example uh, their e yeah. economic in fact they, they're having problems right they, right they're, not they're having, having yeah they're having yeah. population uh, uh decreases so but but the more general question is how much should a government impose on its people for right. the good of the, the greater good right greater and, good and that is an eternal ongoing debate i think to some extent we've answered it the 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 even in the west Governments regularly impose restrictions for the greater good. This is yeah. speed limit all over the place. Yeah. However, seatbelt laws, seatbelt laws. However, every time that one of these things happens, usually there is met with resistance because it's like, why are you telling me what to do? But then the culture changes and everyone gets used to it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there, it, you yeah, can't I, have I, a black on, and white answer to this. On, it's, it's on the, um, the seatbelt law, I was alive when the the trend across the United States, you know, each state has their own laws, was to mandate um, seatbelts. And mm -hmm. it was around the time that I was getting my license, I think, in the mid 80s. And I remember personally feeling pretty upset as because my family, we did not wear seatbelts. Mm. No one wore a seatbelt in my family ever, <laughs> ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember my friend's mom used to make us wear seatbelts and I was so annoyed with her. <laughs> and I was like four years old, I remember, just sitting in the back saying, like, why do we have to wear a seat? It's so dumb. <laughs> and my freedom's so constrained. <laughs> yeah. I mean I didn't I didn't feel my yeah. freedom's constrained. I just felt like it just didn't feel right. Right. It was weird. It was I remember for a while while I was wearing seatbelt, I just felt like, God, it's so restricting. I just, <laughs> I didn't like it. And it only took, you know, I don't know, a few months, and then I was like, oh, it's you know, just normal. Now, if I'm occasionally, I'll be driving to the mailbox or something. I'll be like, well, I, I don't need to put on my seatbelt because I'm just going to jump right out of the right. car. It feels like I'm naked. Yeah. So people get used to things, you know. <laughs> and I, I did I tell you, I I, I would have been dead um, for real. So when I got in this really bad car crash when I was 18, I was in the passenger seat. And I always, always, always wore a seatbelt because my uncle, when he was teaching me how to drive, like the first rule was seatbelt. So I always wore a seatbelt. 
But for whatever reason, this one night, we had gone to a McDonald's, got in this guy's car, and as he's pulling off, I was like, ah, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. We're so close. And then, like, that little voice in my head is like, what? why not? You always wear a seatbelt. Just wear the stupid seatbelt. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, fine. And I reluctantly, or whatever, put the seatbelt on. Well, just a few minutes later, this guy who might have been suicidal was going 70 on an icy road and we hit a tree head on and then spun mm-hmm. around. I didn't know that he might have been suicidal. Yeah. How do you know? He did this, you... Well, because he did this weird thing where he like, we knew it was icy. He counted down and and gunned, gunned it. Oh, the guy who was driving the car. Yeah. Driving your car. Not my car, his car. I know, but you were in his. I thought I, you I meant in another the car was. So yeah. you knew the guy driving the car. Yeah, we were telling, yelling at him to stop, and and both me and the other kid who was in the back were and like, "Stop!" Did he stop! have any other evidence that he was suicidal? He was a depressed kind of kid. I don't know. I, let's ignore that point. But the point was, we crashed. I I I was knocked unconscious, broke my collarbone, hit my head. It was bleeding all over the place. Uh, and the car, if you looked at the picture, which I saw years later, I, it's incomprehensible how someone in the passenger seat survived. But I know one thing for sure. If I hadn't been wearing a seatbelt, I would have been launched in that first impact and would have absolutely perished. So that one brief moment where I debated. <laughs> what influenced you to wear it? My uncle. It was that lesson, like, you're always going to do it. So he saved my life by drilling that into my head. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but your uncle is a bad person for... Limiting my freedoms. No, for <laughs> okay. countering population control. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Which is what Paige yes. Stewart wanted to talk about. Yeah, um, forced population control is extremely complicated, as Berto was saying. The equation, it, as Berto was laying out, is freedom versus the greater good. If we have... A situation where you know 30 percent of the population will revolt or be very upset or you might even have to do forced abortions and really traumatize individuals but you save the planet and you save society then is it worth it you know and the way and- i would start before we get to anything like that would be uh taxation you know, yeah. every additional child, instead of getting tax benefits, you have to pay that much more money. Right. So other more humane ways of social engineering can be employed. Um, and as I said, if we can raise the economic level of people, research shows that on average, uh, the amount of children that they have, you know, greatly decreases. And we've seen that around the world. There's tons of data points pointing towards as people's standard of living increases, then the amount of children they have decreases. Um, up at your patron, Tony from San Ho. Oh, no. But uh, before moving on, you also I wanted to know about social Darwinism. Oh, right. Yeah. So this one is probably even trickier. Uh, we do do some of this. For example, it might sound weird, but okay. When you're pregnant... Uh, you get screened for certain risks. And you're also told not to do certain things because it'll increase the risks of of certain birth defects. Um, That is one kind of prevention. Uh, Also, uh, I believe that, yeah, well, so it's illegal to marry uh, relatives because (laughs) you could say it's a um, moral thing, but actually it also increases the risk of genetic abnormalities, right? So we do a little bit of social Darwinism. What we don't generally do is say, uh, you know, pick the best specimens of this and that and force them to copulate and ban others from copying. That extreme is not something in this part of the world that we practice. It has been done by some societies. And that's, I think, uh, that not only steps too far, in my opinion, but it also reduces the odds that we'll actually have a healthy variety, right? Because... Uh, the whole point is to s- spread the odds around and like have, mix and match the DNA all over the place. Right. I mean, it, it all depends on your ranking because you have to have a you have to develop a ranking of those who are worthy of 
of yeah. procreating and those who aren't. Right. And of course, those dimensions are influenced by racism and ableism and a lot of isms that have nothing to do with reality. To, uh, to, right. to say that <laughs> someone with autism, for example, isn't worthy of, of procreating because they might have an autistic child right. implies that people with autism don't have as much value as someone that does that doesn't have autism. What I say, you know, you know yeah. what I'm saying, or or someone, of course, in the Nazi world that is Jewish or has dark skin. Those people are not worthy of procreate. You know, it it it's hard, of course, <laughs> to determine who is even going to contribute to society. You know, how do we know that such and such person with you know, like someone who was born blind, you know, in the Nazi world, that person would have been socially uh, right. engineered out, right? But uh, Stevie Wonder, yeah. <laughs> Ray Charles, yeah. uh, you know, other people, or, or um, uh, Stephen Hawking, right? So that, someone, that, someone who has a genetic exactly right. disability, uh, he would have been uh, X'd out, but he's incredibly important to our society. So how, do, how are we supposed to determine uh, well, who I mean, that person? We, we also have to remember... Uh, Evolution, the way evolution works, is not engineered. So we can't come up with the formula of what, which things, which variables will work for a better evolution in the long term. We have no way to know that. Yeah. It's impossible. The thing is, you could have right now someone that appears to be a healthy individual and say, okay, well, that's the model we're going with. But what you don't know is that... Like Channing Tatum. Yeah. What you don't know is that they happen to be susceptible to a virus that's going to come in three years that you have no way to predict. Right. Not only that, you also don't know right now that their skin type is going to be more susceptible to the solar radiation from five years from now due to global warming. Like, you can't predict any of these things. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. So, and say it did work-ish where you somehow did predict, wow, we got rid of you know, 35 different genetic uh, right. diseases and the average IQ has increased by right. 10%. What what will that society look like exactly? <laughs> you know, will it be better? Well, will it be more moral? Will it be more humane? Uh, is it is it like actually scientifically more benefit? How do we measure, right? Like, okay, they're smarter. Does that mean it's it's better? As I say this, though, I, I should point out that uh, all these experimentations and changes are still part of nature, meaning before there was DNA evolution, there was atomic and molecular evolution. You know, like certain interactions happened in a way that led to other elements being created, and then those elements created other elements and so forth. Then molecules came, and then from molecules came proteins and blah, blah. Eventually, we got to DNA. So now we're dealing with DNA evolution. But now we're way past DNA in some ways for humans because, you know, we are certainly circumventing tons of physical limitations, right? mental limitations. And now the kind of evolution that, that is happening is somewhat not even human, right? We have digital evolution happening. Right. It'd, it'd be one thing if, if we were still running from saber-toothed tigers yeah. and we wanted to breed people who could run fast. Right. But... We're in a world now where it's like, well, what exactly are we trying to do with? Yeah. Um, so we have the very strange and abnormal political stance, Berto and me, we're against Nazis and against eugenics. Yeah, weird. Uh, upper tier patron Tony from San Jose says, I was wondering about your and Umberto's ideas on the friend zone. <laughs> oh, yeah. During my teen years, my mentor was very adamant whenever it came up that the friend zone doesn't actually exist and it creates a sense of entitlement towards someone's romantic feelings just because you are a kind person to them. This ends up not being genuinely kind and more so an action with an agenda. I've had ex-male friends complain I put them in the friend zone and found it deeply hurtful as it felt like they never saw me as a person merely as a means to an end what do you think <laughs> well i mean i'm sympathetic to that feeling i do think it's unfair that a person be it male female whatever that that you couldn't um draw boundaries for what you want out of a relationship with someone 
that seems unfair. So if you want to put boundaries explicit or implicit to say, well, this person is a friend. I'm not trying to date this person. You, you're totally within your rights to do that. At the same time, I think the experience for the other person can certainly be equivalent to something called the friend zone where they had romantic aspirations and now they feel they've been put in a box that they didn't want to be in. And so I think both things can exist. I've certainly felt when I was young uh, with some people that I'm like, wait, I think, th- I think this person just sees me as a friend and I want it to be more than that. Uh, sad. Right. Yeah, totally. But the discourse around the friend zone word is commonly within what upper tier patron Tony is talking about that implies that the woman, because it's usually a woman and it's usually a man saying I was friend zoned by a woman. It's in, in, in that discourse. It's implied that the woman is denying him something, <laughs> something right. that he deserves, right, right, right. something that should have happened. Now, can someone lead someone on unfairly, knowingly? Yeah, people do that. But a lot of a lot of women are walking around just being nice, right? And they're like, oh, I met someone and I have no romantic interest in them, but uh, yeah, I'd like them to be a friend. And we're, we're hanging out in a group of friends or, oh, they're texting me and we're friends now. And then um, I, like, I like going to movies with them. I, I like talking about this and that with them. Oh, they just said that they liked me and they want to kiss me. No, I just want to be friends. Um, and now they hate me and they're calling me that I've... Now, if the person is hurt, the dude is hurt, like you said, and it's like, well, I don't want to be friends with you. I was romantically attracted to you. Fine. Yeah. But the friend zone word is often associated with all these other distasteful, misogynistic uh, ideas that up with your patron is talking about. I wonder if this has mutated over the last 20 years or so because it used to be, now I'm not sure this is good, but it used to be when I was younger that it was sort of the opposite, like, oh, dude, you got friend zone. You're such a loser. Like, it's the guy's fault for not being, not having game and well, getting that ha- friends. Well, that has another set of misogynistic ideas as if somehow if you played it right, you would have got well, her. Well, but that's true. Uh, well, no, so it's not a guarantee, but it, but it is fair to point out. It's a factor, that, but it's more important that she actually is romantically and physically attracted to you. Well, that, sure. That's, that's a, more but, important but for than, your friends, than your game. But for your friends, the net effect is you failed. <laughs> yeah. And so I used to experience it from that angle, which is now I, I'm not saying this literally happened to me, but I remember the essence of this being, you know, oh, I'm interested in this person. Let's say at a bar, it's like, ooh, I'm interested. You go, you have the conversation, and then they strike up, oh, you seem so nice. And then your friends might say, oh, you've been friend zoned. You're such a loser. Something like that. What I'm interested in is that it seems that, like, over the last N number of years, probably because of the increase in toxic forums of males being frustrated, it seems like now it's the opposite. It's like, ooh, you got friend zoned? What a bitch. Right. Exactly. She friend zoned you. Yeah. She knew what she was doing from the beginning. Right. She knew that she could use, because this is the incel right. m- mantra. Right. Is women use their sexual power right. to manipulate men to do right. whatever they want. And they're Machiavellian, horrible human beings. Women, right. all of them, especially the attractive ones. And the friend zone idea is completely within that. I see. Idiot. Yeah, see, that seems bad. Yeah. Because that's that's a totally different thing. Right. And uh, to reiterate, <laughs> a heterosexual woman can befriend a dude and who and the woman might be like, well, maybe he likes me, maybe he doesn't, but I don't know. Um, maybe I like him, maybe I don't. I don't know. And then over time be like, no, I don't like him, but I do like him as a friend. Um you know, people need friends. And the, the, whenever I tell people who are like complaining about being friend zoned by five women, I'm like, you know how hard it is to find five friends? <laughs> like <laughs> friends are better than dates. <laughs> the chance of dating someone and having it work out is slim. The chance of finding a friend that you can actually hang out with and that can last a lifetime in yeah. all likelihood. So, you know, I'd much rather have a friend than 
than a romantic date. Romantic dates, on average, last like 10 days. I think it is weird that, imagine with you being heterosexual with another heterosexual friend of yours, right? Imagine this thing. Like, let's say when you and I met, right? We meet at karaoke, we start, you know, playing a band. And then one day, uh, you tell me, hey, uh, just so you know, I don't want to have ice cream with you. And then I'm like, oh, you ice cream zoned me. Oh. <laughs> No, I non no, no, non, non ice cream. Zone. <laughs> you froze me out or whatever. And so now I tell you I can't be friends with you anymore. Like that concept doesn't exist, right? Because the sex thing isn't there and there isn't something else like that. Yeah. And well, so it's not just sex, of course. It, it's the I think the incels are desperate for love and attachment and acceptance. But with a friend you can get that. Right. Absolutely. And so you you and I, we were friends. There was no point in the relationship where I was like, but Kirk, I wanted more. Yeah. And so you keep being friends. Yeah. Now you can break up as friends for many reasons, but but with the woman or the, the, the as soon as you have the romantic element between two individuals, now if one doesn't want it and the other one does, now you do have that sort of like all or nothing phenomena. Yeah. Which is really fascinating. Yeah, I just thought about, you know, I think I've been edging towards this perspective for years now. And I don't, I don't think this is incredibly novel, but I, I think I believe it, which is that you could sustain your attachment needs fairly well and much more reliably, particularly if you're struggling with romance, through deep friendships than through romance ever could, or at least as well as romance could. That you're 25 and you're like, oh, you know, romance isn't going well. You get five best friends. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That, Think of how hard that, that is. That you see yeah. eye to eye, you know, like yeah. you and me, Birdo. Yeah. You know, we could talk for hours and we do. Yeah. We we <laughs> like the same movies, you know, we'll text each other. We, you know, like to go to parties together. And The you know. one thing we will not do is have ice cream together. <laughs> yeah. And we'll travel together, you know, we yeah. do a lot of things. And... Uh, you know, because, you know, with my wife, for example, I um, I can't talk with her about movies the way I, even close to what I can talk with you. I ask her, we'll see a movie, we'll walk out, I'll be like, what'd you think? She'll be like, huh? I'll be like, well, what'd you think of the movie? She'll be like, pause. No, no, long pause. Um, yeah, it was fine. <laughs> There's no way Birdo's gonna respond. If I ask Birdo, what she, I, I mean, I, I, I'll say, what? And by the end of what, Birdo's already launching into ten different ideas and theories about what he thinks of the movie um, before I can even ask him. And I enjoy that because I have ten <laughs> stupid things to say as well. Um, and if I didn't have Birdo, then I wouldn't get any of that needs met. And yeah. that's, you know, it's kind of a need that, that need to, to just nerd out and argue about something stupid like a movie. Um, so <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think I'm, I think I'm willing to say that it's not like friendships are a, a temporary replacement for romantic relationships. They could literally be the only thing that you need. Well, especially when you think about like a good friend you might have for the entire life, right? Um, now, you might also marry someone or something for it, but a lot of times you'll have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or, or for just a week, a yeah. month. Particularly you if know. you're dating, you know, yeah. if you're being friend zoned, quote unquote, yeah. you're likely in that dating single yeah. zone. Particularly then, <laughs> the chance the next person you date is going to work out for Ever. Even even <laughs> even ten years yeah. is so small, yeah. you know. Like you, it's a numbers game. You yeah. got to date typically a lot of people before you find right. that one. Anyway, let's take a break. Get back more emails. What do you say, Bruno? Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. Another email, listener Kim says, "Are modern day piropos piropos piropos." Pidopos. Are modern day piropos just another form of harassment? What are piropos? Uh, compliments. Uh, piropo is like, but maybe, you know, in a little aggressive, maybe. So in, in Latin America, piropo, you know, someone's walking down the street. And it's like, it's the whole, 
uh, is angel are angels falling from? I don't even know these, but like, is something broken up in heaven? Why? Because you're an angel and you fell on my head. <laughs> like, Wait, I, what is, <laughs> don't you're know. an angel. You fell on my head. Know. I don't know that Pedopos, but you know, like those those yeah, yeah, yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah, okay. Compliments. Okay. Like um, hola bonita. Or... Are modern day Pedopos just another? What what's that translate as Pedopo? Pedopo is like a compliment. Okay. Like, our modern day, but a, a romantic compliment. Podopos, just another form of harassment. And as a woman, what is the healthiest way to respond? As a child, I was often subjected to podopos from older men, since I was taller and older looking for my age at any given time. And I, I now find myself living in an old neighborhood. And just this evening, once again, I was catcalled by the same type of guys as I was leaving the gas station. I didn't have a problem responding to their hellos with an unengaging smile and a hi, but I was creeped out by their I love yous and straight offended by their quiero foyatas. Foyatas? Folartes? Foyarte? Foyarte? Oh, that's I want to do you. Yeah. Oh, quiero? Quiero, I want. Um, so, Berto, what do you think? Are modern day peropos just another form of harassment? So, yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in this culture for sure where it's a very male-centric thing. The male is supposed to be aggressive and um, very... Explain this to me. Like, how? what's the premise? Like, supposed to be aggressive. Like, you're taught what exactly through other people's acts? Because I didn't grow up in a culture of catcalling. I... Well, not, not even just the catcalling. There is a machismo to growing up in Latin America, when I did anyways, which was, first of all, you're tough. You know, I told you my dad always was like, don't cry, but that was like, it wasn't just me. You know, it's like, you're a tough guy and um, you yeah, have definitely to don't be. cry, but I, I, and I was raised that way too. But the, the cat calling thing. Well, and so, and then, you know, like, first of all, uh, you are d definitely the one initiating the moves, number one, number two. And that um, means you're a real man if, if you're initiating the moves. That's right. Number two, if you have strong personality and you are sure of yourself, you're not going to have any problem telling a woman what you think of her. So you, know? you have a group of five high school kids, mm -hmm. boys, and the one who has the cojones, cojones. to like cat call to do the, 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 the uh, attractive lady walking by, yeah. he's, the, he's the alpha. He's the cock of the walk. Yeah. Cock of the walk. And is that gonna, a thing? Cock of the walk? I don't know. He's the coco Wait, de you la just made that waco. up? No, I didn't. Oh. It's, it's a thing. Cock of the walk. He's el coco de la huaca. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so there was that thing. Also, remember, there is this culture of dancing, right? And the dancing is very physical, very close. Uh, and everyone's kind of dressed to the T. So complimenting is, it's part of that too. Like, Ooh, you know, te ves muy, muy bien. But it also gets very sexual too. And, and also it varies culturally by regions. In, the, in Colombia, the, the Caribbean region, it gets even more sexual, more in your face, the piropos do. And it's more culturally accepted. Um, I think there's also... Accepted or excused? Like are the victims or the recipients, like are they... Do they feel okay with it? Do well, they... I don't know if they feel okay, but it was encouraged, expected, even. From the male side. From the male side. It, I'm just wondering, as the women, are they like... Because I could see a world... Because I've heard women will complain about Seattle men saying that we're not aggressive enough. You know, we don't... Yeah. We don't... Yeah, I think We don't catcall. call. We, yeah. You know, I, I feel like there were some women who would say like men in seattle aren't like latino men yeah and that's what they're used to and i think there is an element where it wasn't only expected it was welcome to a certain degree however but then we but we have someone well, here because Kim, however saying, at the same time like <laughs> right at the same time as all this i remember talking to my friend in the bus when we were in like eighth grade ninth grade and learning that how many times she had been flashed seeing a guy's dick un unwantingly in buses in streets wow. all over the so boy before we had you know dick pics you had you just random dicks <laughs> random shows um i remember sexual my cousin, assault. i mean that's a sexual assault right i there. remember my cousin telling me that she was 
either walking or maybe she was in a car. But either way, a car pulls up next and the guy was jacking off. Like as he was driving yeah. and he looks at her and like makes eye contact. Yeah, there's reports you know? of in Japan that are, I mean, of course it happens in the States, but right. apparently it happens a lot more in some of these other places. And, and so I think now, why am I bringing this up? I think it's part of a continuum and it can go to extremes. And also she was saying she got piropos from older guys. I do think, now look, in, in my culture, I grew up in the middle of Bogota. It was a lot more culturally conservative, a lot more traditional, whatever that means, a lot more. Uh, so, so in other words, I saw less of that. But definitely, I knew the pockets more were reserved, more reserved, yeah, uh, more s- sex was more repressed, maybe even you know, like. But I definitely saw those pockets of, and I have parts of my family that are from those regions, and I and I see that. So I can, I would say, in in summary, I do think piropos as they are fully practiced, at least border on harassment and can definitely lead towards that. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's absolutely harassment. I've seen it in Seattle. Uh, I've I've known and I've talked to women who have been victims. It's absolutely harassment, particularly if you know people are flashing. That's a that's a straight up crime. Oh yeah, of course the flashing. Is. Um, and traumatic. Yeah. It's scary to you know to have something like that happen to you. Uh, you're asking Kim healthiest way to respond. You know, it's a tough question because it's like you can't win because the damage is already done. Um, what are you supposed to do? Like smack him across the face? Is, does that even really solve? You know, there, there's no way to win in that situation. Uh, I've I've known women and I've seen women who will just ignore him. That's one strategy. It's it doesn't feel good, but that's one way to quote unquote win or to make the most out of the situation. I've seen women and I've seen it on Reddit. They'll post uh, videos. Women will just walk calmly up to the dude and just be like, um, "Hey, you know what?" Uh, I don't really appreciate that. You know, if you say it in this very mature, non-reactive way, um, a lot of these cat callers, they don't know what to do because <laughs> they don't expect you to do that. Yeah. Um, a lot of cat callers, they're trying to establish their dominance to other men around them or to you. And if you have this, if you shy away, they kind of win, right? If you freak out and yell at them, um, and quote unquote make a fool out of yourself according to their metric of how to do that, then they win. But if you walk up to them and go, hey, you know what? Like it, it, that just kind of hurts. It kind of makes me feel bad when you do that. I know you don't, you're probably not a bad person, but you know, it, it just, it just kind of ruins my day. I'm just trying to walk to the store. And when you say stuff like that, it just kind of it's kind of bothers me. Now, he's probably not going to say like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. He might, but he probably won't. But that is one way to respond. You're not necessarily winning, but it's totally viable. It's I would consider that to be the most mature thing to do. Just walk up and say, hey, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not really a fan of that behavior. I don't know what you expect me to do when you do that. Um, I'm not attracted to you. I mean, look at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but is there a range? Because... I can definitely get, look, especially knowing how, how threatened females are by males uh, abusing them in so many instances, right? But so, and I can understand if I'm walking, I'm a female, I'm walking down the street and like four dudes up where I can barely even see them are like, wow, wow, you know, whatever. Like that, that sounds threatening. Like what's it's happening? Abso- it's absolutely okay. threatening. Yeah. However, different scenario. You know, I'm dressed up nicely. I walk up to a store or maybe a bar or something, and there's a guy at the door and he goes, "Oh, you look great today." You know. Well, what is that okay? Um, it depends on if she wanted you to say that or but not. But you can't know that. Then don't say it. No, but see, that's what I'm saying. I I think that is lost. Something gets lost in that shuffle. For example. And it also matters like which way we're going. What I try to do, and I'm not a sort of person that would do this, but when I think about this question, and I've thought thought about this for decades actually, because when I first, because as a man, I never experienced this before. And when I would hear women, and I knew about catcalling, but I just thought it was this random, very rare thing. But I would talk to attractive women and they would tell me, no, no, this happens all day long. (laughs) Like, uh, you know, if I'm on, if I walk to the bus, you know, it's like all day long. And if I, even at work, my boss will comment, 
You know, I go to the club and it's just like unrelenting. And yeah, I like to look nice, but the male gaze and the the Mm -hmm. lack of safety and just keep it to yourself. When I see, you know, they would, women would say, when I see a a good looking guy, I don't say something. I just appreciate it and move on. Maybe I'll smile or something, but I'm not going to be like, hey, I see your your junk in your trunk, you know, like, (laughs) you know, it's, it's like, why? And, um, now, sure, sure. Some women might dig it. And maybe maybe there, maybe there are ways that they can signal like, Hey, by the way, what do you think? Or who knows? But (laughs) But, but, but maybe you're right about the quantity because, but, but my point is, is that when I think about this, I, I think about, and again, I'm not a cat caller, so I wouldn't do that. But I think about what, if you are, if you you're that bouncer and the woman's walking up and she looks attractive, the question you should ask yourself one is is there a is there any sign that tells me that this person wants me to say something? Two. What's the chance that they haven't been told this already? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like um cuz yeah. often attractive women are commented on constantly. So even if you're a nice guy, the chances are They've heard this five times already today in context where they didn't want to hear it, and I don't want to add to that. Sure. So just appreciate, smile, be nice, but don't, you know, don't I think I think you're right about the quantity, but like, so years ago, and I'm talking about years ago, I got catcalled. I was jogging. I was wearing... <laughs> the one time, and, and you remember... Yeah. yeah. I mean, because that, cause that's... That's right. That's the reality. I was running in little shorts, and I had no shirt on, and I, I was quite fit at the time, and I'm running, and I was tan. It's in the middle of the summer. A car goes by. Where, I don't, where were you? In Bellevue? I was in Redmond. Okay. A car goes by. I don't know how many people were in the car, what age range. I have no idea. All I know is a couple of female voices ring out and say some quick complimentary thing and then keep wait, wait, driving. Wait, wait. what'd they say well i don't remember like i just know they looking. i don't remember the detail of what they said but i just know that they cat called me but they were, granted they weren't saying like oh stick out your dick suck me off or what you know, like, you know it wasn't it wasn't mean or, or or weird you know it wasn't yeah it'd be weird if anyway yeah. <laughs> anyways but it was a cat call though yeah it made my day yeah it, it made my life, but right. I still remember it. What's your point? What's <laughs> well, your point? Well, that I'm agreeing with you that I think the quantity matters because... Well, and the gender matters. No, fine. Because women don't typically R-word men. They can, absolutely. Sure. But particularly in that context, it doesn't happen very often. But listen, I'm going to push a little bit in this, into this. And maybe I am wrong, right? But there's a lot of females that don't feel good about themselves, that don't get catcalled, that don't get compliments. And they might need some compliments. <laughs> um, predicting which individuals want to hear that <laughs> would be, uh, and well, what if we compliment the it, people that 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 we might compliment the least? That assumes that they want to hear someone catcall them. Not catcall, just but like, it's it's a male gaze thing no, too. Forget the gaze. It's I'm looking at you. Uh, I'm I'm taking you in, you know. It's a gross thing yeah, to experience. You're, you're making it gross. It can <laughs> simply be like, "Wow, those are really cool shoes." Okay, like, well, that's a little know, different than catcalling. That's what I'm saying. So I agree. That's not calling complimenting someone on their shoes is not catcalling. Well, but you could also compliment their purse. That's not catcalling. You could also say, "You look, your hair looks great today." We're edging towards catcalling, right. but I'm saying. Maybe maybe yeah. this person doesn't to, usually hear that. Okay. You know, <laughs> I, I know you know, and I know that this is a, you know, age-old sort of, not age-old, but it's a common debate, and it's complicated. The, and sure, there are some women who might actually like being catcalled occasionally in, in a certain way, in a certain context. Um, and there might even be some women, heterosexual women, who are actually a little bummed out that they're not being catcalled anymore. Uh, I would say that it's rare, but, you know, sure. I've heard women say that they kind of like this and that. That's fine. The issue is, as I'm sure you're agreeing with, Berto, is that you cannot predict, as a dude, on the street, a stranger, whether or not they are they want to hear something or they don't. Right. So just don't. <laughs> That's the point. 
don't. <laughs> There's no importance of it. You're just doing it because of probably misogynistic reasons. Anyone who claims they're catcalling because they're trying to lift her up, <laughs> I just have to say, at, you know, like, get out of your delusion um, and listen to people talk about their experience and you won't do it anymore. Complimenting, complimenting someone on their shoes? Yeah, maybe, you know. Uh, how about just a smile and a hello? Hey, how you doing? I, like, I, if you want to <laughs> connect with someone, just human to human, eye contact, <laughs> hey, What's your favorite movie? You know, there's right. other ways to connect than commenting on a woman's body. But listen, I, I do think so. One of the bridges that are hard to cross, there are a set of males, the maybe the more toxic uh, Mick Gow or whatever, uh, incels or whatever, that they definitely don't experience compliments, right? And so when they hear someone saying, Oh, my life is terrible, I was complimented all day. Totally. Right? They're like, oh, poor, poor, but they don't get it when it's because they don't right. experience it. Yeah. And if you actually do experience, to your point, hey, pretty, oh, pretty, hey, blah, blah, all the time, all the time. Okay, and, that sucks. And some of those individuals end up assaulting them sexually. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what you know sexual assault criminals will do sometimes is they will lead the way with those compliments. Um, and there are gang situations as well. Anyway. So I asked people on Discord to submit a bunch of easy questions for us to answer, Brito. I thought we would end with those. What do you oh, say? Oh, yeah. Easy is better. MS on Discord says, if you and Berto were able to use a time machine, what year would you want to travel to, past or future? And what would you like to do during that time? Past or future? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Ah, I think I wrote this down, but I'm trying to remember what I said. Okay. Um... It, it, no consequences? Well... Like no time, right. you know, weirdness? Yeah. You're not going to erase... You're not going to make Hitler win or something. Right. Then I'm probably going to do a Beatles-related trip. Ooh. You know? I'm going to... Cavern? Or Hamburg? Seems like Hamburg would be funner because you get Hamburg to hang... Hamburg is a blast. You get to hang with You them. actually get to meet them. Yeah, because, you know, but, yeah. but Cavern Club... Cavern is already... You're not going to be able to... famous... Yeah. You might not even be able yeah, to hang out and, with them. And you're being drowned out. But it's not, definitely, Hamburg. That's yeah. a great... I'm going to Hamburg. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's 10,000 years in the future. Because <laughs> if we succeeded and we've progressed... <laughs> no! Then I'll live forever because we've solved death by that point. Sure. <laughs> and maybe even time travel, you know? <laughs> Uh, no famine. But you are time traveling. What are you talking about? <laughs> I know, but but they probably have they have a di but then I could go back to I could go back to Cavern Club from ten thousand years from now. Oh, I see. Because they probably have more. One they probably have actual okay. time machines in okay. the future. If if we failed as a, as a race and it's a wasteland or the Stone Age, then I'll just know that my life was meaningless to begin with. And, <laughs> wow. Uh, good old Orla on Discord says. What countries have you traveled to in Europe, Brito? Oh, man. Only England and um, Sweden. Yeah. You've been to Sweden a couple times, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you enjoyed Sweden? Oh, yeah. I mean, did you like vacation? Oh, not all over, but I was I was in three different cities. Stockholm, of course. And then I went to um, a little island. What was the island called? Oh man, I'm blanking on the name, but it was really cool. It was it used to be a port island, and this island originally had no trees on it, and they planted trees. But because they planted them, you know, purposely, it's the weirdest looking forest because everything is in perfect rows. <laughs> so it looks like out of a movie, you know, out of one of those like either an, uh, a kung fu thing or you know, it's just weird or a matrix thing. So I've been to Greece, France, and UK. I think that's it. Uh, I've I've only been to Europe twice, I believe. You know, it's funny. I'm so old now. Uh, some uh, maybe just maybe just like a few years ago, I crossed this line where people would ask me things like this. Yeah. And before I could answer with a hundred percent assuredness. Now You're like, I'm hmm. like, well, and it's not because hmm. of like 
age memory <laughs> loss. No, it's that so many things. There's happen. too many years to account yeah. for. You're like, in the first century of life, <laughs> literally, like in the 20th century. Yeah. You know. Um, next yeah. question from good old Orla. Do you like snow holidays? Well, I mean, do you mean like when when there's too much snow, so you have to stay home? Yeah, everything shuts down. Oh yeah. First of all, I didn't grow up with snow holidays. I had a couple in New York when I was like five and six, and I remember and it was fun. But then in Colombia, there's no snow. So when I moved here, I was actually upset because the first winter I was here was the winter of 1990 in Tacoma, Washington. It snowed a lot that winter, and we had. In my neighborhood, there was this. Oh hill. my God! Yeah, we could sled down it. We could do well, all these things. Well, it was winter, 80, 89 to ninety, or, or no, no, ninety to ninety one. Ninety ninety one. Yeah, I remember it was like it's awesome. Yeah, I was at UW at the time, and we uh, in in the frat got tables Ooh. and sled down the viaduct. <laughs> oh my God! Oh my God! That's awesome. We nearly oh, killed yeah, ourselves because there's no there's no, there's no railing, and that. we we would get moving yeah. like. Maybe like, yeah. I don't know, 70 miles an hour. Down okay, there. so nothing that extreme, but we had a neighborhood hill. And so in my mind, and we had and missed several days because of snow and stuff. I was in seventh heaven. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's like I saw in the movies. Next year, nothing. It didn't <laughs> snow like that until nope. 08. Yeah, it was such say. a disappointment. But yeah, I loved snow days. I still do. I, 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 people are like, oh, darn it, it snowed. Like, I'm so pissed off. I'm always so happy in a snow. Why? Day. I don't know. Why am I happy? Yeah. Oh, because I, first of all, I love the snow. I get to play in the snow. Okay. Also, there, no one can complain. And now during the pandemic, it was different because everyone was already not out. So, <laughs> but before the pandemic, no one can complain. Why are you not out? Because it snowed. Yeah. In Seattle, I would say on average, every other year will have enough snow to constitute snow. Like yeah. every year there'll be a dusting yeah. and then it'll melt like, you know, by eight o'clock. But about every other year we'll have like maybe one or two days where it's like, oh, you know, there's a right. good amount of snow. <laughs> and then every 10 years we get like a huge amount of snow. Right. And a, was it a couple years ago? We had a huge yeah. amount of snow. Yeah. And we actually lost power in our neighborhood for like uh, a week or something. And um, anyway, so um, do I like snow holidays? No. As a kid, <laughs> for Birdo's reasons, I did. But as an adult, I find it to be incredibly inconvenient. I can't go to the store. <laughs> I, uh, I If I lose power. Oh, yeah. Power loss is kind of lame. Yeah. I love the look of snow. Yeah. I love walking in the snow. I love playing in the snow, but it r can really ruin my life. Because <laughs> in Seattle, it, it snows infrequently and so little that we don't have any plows. Yeah. So people that live in like Milwaukee, for example, when it snows, the, the plows come out. They're ready. And you can drive. Yeah. You don't need chains. Or your driveway, you're used to using chains or something. You, know, you have a system. In Seattle, the entire it's right in the middle zone where we have no way of coping yeah. with snow and the every the infrastructure everything just falls apart and um with very little like yeah yeah uh next question from Goto orla what would you bring with you on a desert island yeah so <laughs> i would bring my level thyroxine pills which keep me alive now um oh, i would right. also can i bring a few things or just one? oh sure okay i mean um, so I would bring a guitar for sure mm. and hold a, maybe an extra a pair lot of strings. Of strings. Yeah, yeah. Extra pair of strings, uh, some soft picks. <laughs> um, and then in addition to that, I, I mean, I need some clothing, sunscreen. <laughs> You'd run out eventually though. Oh God. Well, for me, I would bring a fully charged sat phone. To rescue, get, get rescued. Yeah. Yeah. But if I couldn't bring that, I would bring pen and paper because before there were cell phones and laptops and stuff, as a therapist, I was doing a lot of in-home therapy in the night, early, late 90s, early aughts. And I didn't have a laptop. I didn't have a cell phone. 
um, I might have had a cell phone, but you know they didn't. It was just like a simple. It, all that was was a phone. It didn't have internet or anything. And I had to often entertain myself because I'd have like an hour or two in between clients. You know, I'd be like in Enumclaw mm -hmm. with two hours to kill. And if I had, and I always did, I had pen and paper. Yeah. And there were so many things I could do with pen and paper. I could doodle, I could journal, I could plan, I could write lyrics, I could write stories, I could, you know, figure out what I'm doing with my life. I could contemplate things, pen and paper for me. I, if I have that, cause you know, I'm just thinking a desert island. Well, I'd bring the internet. Well, you can't I'd bring <laughs> a laptop. Well, the, you know, the yeah. battery will go. Out. But if I had pen and enough paper and enough pens, <laughs> I think <laughs> I would be able to stay, you know, sane for a good amount of time. Good old Nini, you know, Nini. Yeah. Birdo. What is your favorite dinosaur? Uh, yeah. So forever, my two favorites were, uh, T-Rex and Triceratops. Uh, but it, funny enough, it was because I thought that those were the two dinosaurs that fought in Fantasia, but it was actually a, a, a Stegosaurus was the, uh, mm. dinosaur. So I'm going to have to go still with T-Rex. T-Rex was, Oh, how uh, basic of you. But no, listen, man, imagine you're five years old. You walk into the museum of natural history in New York. And they have that T Rex right there. Yeah, that's I. Do you also like pumpkin spice lattes? I do. And Taylor Swift. I love Taylor Swift. And you drive like a Honda. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine is Triceratops, which I think is also kind of basic. <laughs> I love Triceratops. That's my second favorite. Yeah. Um, Nini also says, "Am I fired because I like the vines better than the Strokes?" When I was a, when I was a teenager, um, the answer is no. I, I love the vines. The vines are fun, uh, but the Strokes are a superior band. They it? have so much more output. Number of ways, but the vines are they're great. Not soft noodles. Good old soft noodles says, "Would your teenage self like and respect your adult self if he could somehow meet you as you are now, Berto?" Oh my gosh, that is a great question, isn't it? Really good. I. I, there is a pro. There's a couple problems. First of all, my teenage self would be horrified that I am not religious. Number one. Number two. Uh, I guess me too. My teenage self would be. I think my teenage self was very offensive in many ways, and might feel that I am a prude and too uptight about a lot of things. Ah, oh, yeah. Right? I could see that. Also, my teenage self might feel that I didn't accomplish as much as they thought I was going to accomplish. What did What did you think you were going to accomplish? You know, be the next Einstein and rule the world. Uh, okay. Nothing major. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, as a teenager, had extremely vague dreams that definitely weren't things like, I'm going to be, you know, the next Einstein. It wasn't anything like that. I think... I had hopes of being a musician, but I didn't have any delusions that I was going to be big or anything. But I think I would respect me because I think the dream or the hope I did have was I just wanted to have a career that, you know, provided comfort. And I think I absolutely surpassed that because my career is actually something that's, you know, as a podcaster, therapist, professor has a lot of creativity and fun and interesting things. And so I uh, I would think that I would actually be pleasantly surprised at what I accomplished. I remember, uh, not in high school, but maybe when I was like 20, I calculated that if I could only earn 30,000 a year, <laughs> I would be set for life. Uh, I remember promising myself that I would settle and yeah. just kind of get comfortable in a thirty thousand dollar year job. I remember those those calculations. In my case, it was it, many years later as well. It, the magic number was eighty grand. Yeah, eighty grand. But eighty grand, I didn't see it as like, oh, that's okay. To me, eighty grand it was like was rolling. It. Yeah, yeah. But by the way, like, and I think you meant it in the same way. It wasn't just like. Oh, 80,000 would be nice. No, it was, I will never want any more than that. Right. Well, like, and in fact, <laughs> I, I wanted to vow that I wasn't going to become so materialistic right. that I was going to chase 
you know, right. the ever God, money. Yeah. It's, you earn more than you spend more than you earn more than you spend more. And it's just like, it's yeah. this treadmill. Anyway, MS says anything on your bucket list that is not work related. Berto. Oh yeah, D- definitely. I mean, I have to finish my book and, um, well, that's the main thing. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I want to, okay, this is a uh, um, big revelation. I want to, at some point quit my job. Um, you know, and retire or do something. No, else? no, no. I mean, I will never retire, but I I want to do something different, like a, become an author or a yeah. U- YouTuber. Yeah, make video games. That's your. That's your. Well, you did do that for a while. Yeah, long time ago in a different life. <laughs> uh, for me, I don't have a bucket list. I I don't know why I'm like this, but. Ever since I thought about these sorts of things, as a even as a teenager, I always thought that I'm good. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm content. Uh, there are things that I, particularly now, after 50 years, I feel like I've really done, a, you know, I was trying to think, when I saw this question earlier, I was trying to think, okay, what, what haven't I done? You know, the first things that pop into your head are like, trips or something and yeah and i i'm with you that those kinds of things uh like it just doesn't yeah like if i died in tomorrow or 30 years from now and i never went on another trip like i think that would kind of be a little bit of a disappointment but not much i yeah there are much more important things to me than that in fact to me the the trip part is because i do want to see my colombian family yeah no i agree with you and same thing for me like there's a an infinite list of cool things to do, like jumping off an airplane. Right, think, exactly. So the next yeah. <laughs> thing that pops into mind is like, is like uh, skydiving or bungee jumping or something. I went skydiving. <laughs> and if it's anything, the older I get, the less I want to do that kind of <laughs> stuff because I, I'm brittle. Yeah. I've got brittle bones. <laughs> yeah, like some, I'll pull something, you know. And so I'm not interested in that anymore. And then I'm like. Well, what about like some epic party? And I'm like, dude, I've been to some epic parties, you know? <laughs> I know. Like, I know. I, and I, I, I don't feel like I need that. I'm so with you. I, I, I re- that's why my, my only thing was like, I set this goal, I want to finish it. <laughs> yeah, but so you know. I, I don't, you know, some people say like, well, where do you want to take the podcast? I guess, you know, but it's not really a bucket list. It is a long-term goal of creating a training program for young parents so that they can attune to their children such that we can reduce a lot of the things that result from uh, attachment disruption. I do want to create a foundation that pulls together a lot of different people and money uh, to fund such a thing. But if that doesn't happen, it's like, well, I don't know. You only live so long. Yeah. So, but I've always been this way. I, you know, people would say like, well, what do you want to do in five years? And I'm like, I don't know. Things are good. <laughs> uh, good old Allie says, pineapple on pizza, respond. Oh, yes. I mean, first of all, of course. Like, I love how, I love how there's this assumption like, that must be a crazy notion. First of all, the fact that we're having the conversation is because the thing was invented. And guess what? Tons of people agree with it. It's awesome. Right. If it sucked, we wouldn't know about it because no one would buy it. <laughs> yeah. No. So I no longer Is eat. this an East Coast thing? Because to me, Hawaiian pizza yeah. with, you know, what, we call, bacon, what we call Canadian bacon and pineapple is ubiquitous yeah. on the West Coast. Absolutely. And so is it just not ubiquitous? Well, and in Colombia. <laughs> oh, it is too? Yeah. Is it not ubiquitous in New York City or something? Because I'm wondering, who are these people that that have just on well, pineapple, but have just woken up to the fact that some people eat pineapple <laughs> on their pizza? It's like overnight, right. people are like, "You eat pineapple on your pizza?" Now, now here's the deal: I I, I rarely eat meat anymore. I, I will confess that, as of recently, I did have some pork, but I rarely eat meat. So I no longer have Canadian bacon and pineapple on pizza. However, when I have pizza, which is also not that common, I will have pineapple on it. I'll have like onions and olives and pineapple and help. And that might be even weirder for people because I'm combining a lot of weird things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, pineapple and pizza. Absolutely. Growing up, there were four pizzas that you could order from, we had Pietro's and we had Shakey's. You have cheese. 
Well, I'm leaving that off. But we had yeah, Godfather. Pepperoni? You had pepperoni and olives. It was almost always pep oh, really? and olives. Yeah, yes. isn't that weird? But they don't do that anymore. And then sausage? Um, well, that we had the combo. Okay, combo. It was like meat lovers kind of combo. No, it was... Well, yeah. No, it was pepperoni and onions and green all, green pepper. Okay. It was just kind of like a lot of okay. things. Um, you had mushrooms. Probably mushrooms was on combo, too. And then you had Hawaiian. And Hawaiian. You know, maybe you had some sausage in there, maybe, but not usually. It was like pepperoni for sure. We had this thing called combo, which was veggies and yeah. pe- pepperoni. Mushrooms, definitely a thing. And then you had Hawaiian. Yeah. Those are the four choices. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't like today where, yeah. you, where you can walk into a pizza shop and not recognize anything on the menu. <laughs> right. Like every pizza is like, <laughs> what is, you know, we got feta, which I love on pizza. Yeah. You got tomatoes and you have like different sauces, you know, and pesto and stuff. Like when I was a kid, you got, you know, it was just four choices as far as I remember. Maybe a fifth one in there somewhere, but it was extremely limited so if, if you didn't have a hawaiian you were extremely right. limiting yourself did i tell you there was a burger joint in bogota when i was growing up that they started making hamburgers that had pizza flavor and taco flavor <laughs> so like you could pick one or the other and it was hilarious because i loved my three favorite foods as a kid were number one what were hamburgers number two were uh, was pizza number three was hot dogs those two might have been reversed but those were the three yeah and at this place they had two of my favorites but it was of course terrible i mean in retrospect it, they probably just added like weird artificial flavors and seasonings and stuff uh to make pizza flavored hamburger <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. My pizza, uh, I have so many pizza stories. And I worked at Godfather's. My, I'll tell two little bits about that. I had graduated with my bachelor's in business from UW and had a really hard time finding a job. I got a job as at Foot Locker selling shoes in Westlake with a bachelor's degree in business. I'm selling <laughs> shoes and hating the job and quit like when I just, I can't take it. My boss was a complete a-hole, so I just left. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I have like $5 in my wallet. I'm in Ballard. It's raining. It's the fall. It's probably like this time of year. And I'm like just driving around Ballard going, I have $5. I have a gallon left of gas. Uh-huh. I'm just going to drive around in misery, hoping that a job just hits me in the oh face. Because back then you had the one ads <laughs> in, in the Seattle Times. That's Why all you had. Why didn't you go on Google? Yeah. <laughs> And you would send, they would say, send your resume. Right. And so I would send my resume. I'd never get a call back because, you know, I didn't know anyone there and blah, blah, blah. And I got a job at, and I drove by Godfather's and it said hiring drivers. I went in and they just used that sign uh, to trick people into becoming dishwashers. And so I was a dishwasher for, for a while at Godfather's. Then I moved up to making the pizzas. These jobs were, mi- were miserable um, minimum wage jobs, you know. And then I was like, I have a bachelor's degree in business. Like, I'm going to pull my weight around. And I said, I'm quitting unless you give me a driver's job. I got a driver's job. (laughs) And the one nice thing about working at Godfather's was they had this giant pizza at the time. It was bigger than a large. The way they had larges, but then they Uh had this giant pizza. Was it square? No, it was round, but it was... uh, Was it three feet across or something? Oh, my God. It, It was... I think it was three feet. I think that's Jeez. the thing. It's three feet diameter, something like that. How do you even... The box must have been... It was huge, yeah. And maybe it wasn't... Anyway, it was bigger than a large, whatever. Yeah. you can. Larges are big, anyway. And the, the great benefit, because me and my roommates were so poor, that every once in a while, one of those giant... Any, any one of the pizzas would get messed up. But when a yeah. giant pizza got messed up, this is like... Ooh... I could eat one of those pizzas for like five days. That's a woolly mammoth. You just yeah. scored a woolly mammoth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, but the ironic thing was you could be the one to screw it up. <laughs> so you could screw it up and go, oops, I screwed oh, up. No. And then you could take it home. The uh, incentive. Yeah, oh. I never did that. I never did that. But, 
but every once in a while it would get and i was Oops, sh- i was shameless I did it yeah. again <laughs> i was shameless i remember because there'd be five other yeah other young people that probably wanted the pizza but i'm like assertive and right. i'm like I'm taking it. I have a business degree. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the sad thing about this is that I'd bring it home. I put it in the fridge. It barely fit. <laughs> and I would buy really cheap shredded cheese from the Safeway. Uh-huh. And I would extend the life extend the of this life. pizza by putting more cheese on zombie it zombie pizza and putting it in the oven right and uh right because the first layer becomes that glassy kind of yeah, yeah. it's just like well i could extend the oh, life of this gross. pizza by adding more more cheese to it and so it was this mound of shredded cheese on top and i would eat that thing for a few days and i'd just be like because it was good yeah. one but two I wouldn't have to buy yeah. food for a while. Yeah. yeah. So I made the, the money <laughs> go far. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, yes, pineapple on pizza is delicious. Yes, the strokes are definitely better than the vines. Um, and yes, going 10,000 years in the future is much better than going to Hamburg to see the Beatles because they have time travel 10,000 years from now and you'd be able to go anywhere you want. You're going to get stuck over there while I'm sitting there partying with the Fab Four and Stu Studcliffe. And take care of yourself because you deserve it.